I started life in Northern Ireland in County Armagh, a small town called Lurgan, and I went to school at Lurgan College up to the age of about 13. Their prep department was very small, two classrooms, two teachers. And out of that situation, I failed the 11 plus, or the qualifying, as we called it in Northern Ireland. This was a quite important exam. It determined whether you were going to be academic or have a vocational career. For a woman, it determined whether you were going to get a grammar school education or whether you'd train to be a secretary, a filing clerk, a hairdresser, an unregistered nurse, but actually you were going to get married, so those other things didn't matter. But uh, my parents wangled it that I stayed in the grammar school stream and so for the next couple of years, I was in the senior part of Lurgan College. And I remember the delight of going into secondary school. You start new subjects. You move around from room to room, carrying an enormous bag of books, and you've got different teachers. I thrilled to it. But I remember the Wednesday, the first week, message went round the first year class. This afternoon, please, the girls to such and such a room and the boys to such and such a room. I thought it was for sport, but it was actually for science. They sent the boys to the science lab and the girls to the domestic science room. I don't suppose that County Armagh was alone in that 60 years ago. I suspect that might have happened in many other counties in Ireland. I had been promised by my parents I'd get to do science when I got to secondary school, so I was very disappointed. I protested to the domestic science teacher, but uh, she wasn't very receptive. I told my parents that evening they hit the roof, as did the parents of another girl. Her father was the local GP and the parents of yet another girl. And when the science class next met, it consisted of all the boys in the first year, and three girls, and the teacher made us sit right under his nose. We were clearly dynamite or something. And we did physics that first term, and I came top of the class, beating all the kids who'd passed 11 plus. I'd love to think that school learnt something from that. <laughs> but, You know, it takes time to change society, change attitudes. It's a slow and quite painful process. I went away to boarding school in England at age 13. I had a very nice physics teacher there who was very encouraging and for my final exams did two maths and physics. I went to Glasgow to do a physics degree. I had been at a Quaker girls' boarding school and thought life was a little sheltered and I needed to get out into the real world. I think I overdid it a bit. But it was a good degree. The main difficulty was, for the honours years, I was the only female. And it was a tradition, in inverted commas, that when a woman entered the lecture theatre, all the guys would whistle, stamp, cat call, bang their desks, make as much noise as they could. And I had to face that on my own for the final two years. It meant I was a bit isolated, didn't have a group to work with, um, but I got through passably and went to Cambridge ultimately to do a research degree. I lived in a women's hall of residence in Glasgow and when at the beginning of the junior year I came home and said, I think I'm the only woman in the class, they said, oh, you'll be changing course then, Jocelyn, won't you? That hadn't actually occurred to me. I had known from my teenage years that I wanted to be an astronomer, a radio astronomer, if I possibly could. And this is part of the necessary route to do that. But I have to admit that a lot of the other women at that time in Glasgow 
Well, they were only doing past degrees, not honours degrees, because they reckoned they were only going to get married. There wasn't a high level of ambition or aspiration. And I was a bit in a minority, A, knowing what I wanted to do, and B, you know, determined to do it if I possibly could. Rather to my surprise, I ended up in Cambridge. I've come from Northern Ireland, Scotland, north of England, and I find myself in Cambridge, this southern mecca of learning, where they're all incredibly clever. Hang on to that idea, because it's part, I think, of the story. When graduate students joined that particular group in Cambridge, they got presented with a set of tools, and these are mine. And look at the size of them. These are not microelectronics tools. These are tools for quite heavy wire work. You're going to be heaving and cutting. And it was true. I spent the first two years of my time in Cambridge helping build a radio telescope. A lot of it working, quotes, in the field. And this slide is in the field. <laughs> and not very warm field, as you may deduce. Um, for those who are, are into electronics, electrical engineering, um, we've been putting some plugs on some low-loss cables. Uh, the man, Don Rolf, our technician, is standing with the plugs just a short distance from his nose. And I'm sitting in front of a slotted waveguide, checking the impedance of those cables. It's been my job to put all the plugs and connectors on for this radio telescope. As I said, it took two years. At the end of the two years, the rest of the construction team melted away, and I was left to run the telescope myself with some supervision from my thesis advisor for the next six months. Pre-computers. Well, not strictly true. There was one computer for the whole of the University of Cambridge. And it occupied a large room and had memory less than your laptop. The head of our research group, Martin Ryle, had time on it um, at sort of two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. His female computing assistants went in at that time to feed it punched cards. He was doing Fourier inversions, so that's quite tough to do without a computer. But no other academic had access to the computer. They had graduate students instead. And our data came out on paper chart, reams of it. And the slide shows me analyzing some of this paper chart. There was 100 foot, 30 meters of it every day. So by the end of six months, there was five kilometers plus of this stuff. And I can assure you, I looked at every centimeter of that kilometers of stuff. I quickly got used to identifying the things that the telescope was meant to see. I also quickly got used to identifying artificial interference. Pirate radio stations, things like Radio Caroline were a pest because they broadcast in our you know, quiet wave bands. But also badly suppressed cars, sparking thermostats. And these days it would be mobile phones and microwave ovens that give problems. But I was being very, very thorough. And I wanted to understand how that telescope worked, how the piece of kits performed. And noticed that occasionally, intermittently, there was a curious signal that didn't look like what I was looking for, didn't look like artificial intelligence, sorry, artificial interference, didn't look like any of the other curiosities that the telescope could sometimes produce. And having discussed it with my advisor, finally decided to follow this up. It was difficult to follow up because it went on strike for about a month. And I had a very frustrating month with a very angry supervisor. It's a flare star. It's been and gone. It's done it. You've missed it. Those of you who've been grad students, those of you who are graduate students will know your function in life is actually for the relief of your supervisor's frustrations. It's a bit like kicking the cat. 
in its similar function. But finally, the thing came back, and on the middle trace here, you can see the signal that I picked up. The bottom signal is artificial time pips, one second time pips. And you can perhaps see that there's a string of pulses. Some missing, but still a string of pulses. In a spacing of about one and a third seconds. And even when there's some pulses missing, it comes back on beat. It keeps beat, even if we don't hear all the beats. Now, we'd never seen anything like this in astronomy. We did not believe there could be anything like this in astronomy. And when I called my thesis advisor to say that this funny signal was a string of pulses one and a third seconds apart, his very natural reaction was, oh, well, that settles it. It's man-made. I'm not good at marshalling arguments quickly. I didn't believe him, but I couldn't get the argument out in the course of the phone call. But I've been dealing with this funny signal for several months. And a feature of the stars is they don't come round on a 24-hour basis. You may know that the constellations in the winter sky are different from the constellations in the summer sky. That's because the stars get four minutes earlier each day. And this thing, whatever it was, had been getting four minutes earlier each day for several months. What sort of man works to that schedule? Well, astronomers, but not many others. So it was a huge, huge puzzle. And we kept observing it, and we gradually began to eliminate some ideas, wild ideas. So very quickly, I persuaded my advisor that it wasn't local artificial interference. Was it some fault with the equipment? When you get a crazy result, you've got to start right back at square one and test everything. Jocelyn's been responsible for all the connectors. Has she got some wires crossed? Is that what's producing this funny signal? Well, we got a colleague with another radio telescope and another receiver to see if they could pick it up. And ultimately, after some scary moments, they did. So it's not a fault of the equipment. But it's a real puzzle. If I go back a slide, you can see that those pulses are quite short. They rise, they drop. Things that change rapidly like that come from a small source. But equally, we were observing this day, well, I was observing this day after day after day, and it keeps beating very, very, very regularly. It is not getting tired. If it's not getting tired, it's big. It's got masses of energy. So it's small, and it's big. Yippee. <laughs> you have to ask the question slightly more precisely. You have to be better physicists to unravel that one. It's small in the sense of its width on the sky. It's big in terms of its mass. Still didn't help us because we didn't really know about these pulsars, compact objects, but gradually it made sense. A colleague got an estimate of the distance, put the thing way beyond the solar system, but well within our galaxy, so it begins to look like stellar. My supervisor was still hung up on the idea that it was man-made, so we thought, okay, it's not human man. Is it little green man? Artificial intelligence. Well, if it is artificial intelligence, they probably live on a planet which goes round their sun. And they're broadcasting these pulses for some reason, towards us for some reason. But as they move towards us, the pulses will be piled up on each other and the space between them will be smaller. And when they're moving away from us, the pulses will be spaced further apart. So we kept observing, I kept observing, and we couldn't see any effect other than that due to the motion of the Earth around the sun, because that also can give you this Doppler effect. And when we reach a sort of crunch, we've got one of these. We don't really know what it is. 
we know roughly where it is. How do you publish one crazy result? We had a meeting, we didn't solve it. And later that evening, because by now I was running miles behind with the routine chart analysis, came back in to do some more chart analysis. Had to be out by 10 o'clock because they locked the lab and I didn't have a key, so and I didn't want to be locked in all night. About five to 10, scrutinizing another piece of chart. What's that? Jiminy, it's five to 10. Um, okay get out all the other charts where we've observed this bit of sky, spread them out rapidly. That's the one I've just seen. No, no. Oh, it might be there. Ah, I didn't notice that. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, this is interesting. That bit of sky is observed by the telescope at two o'clock in the morning. I've got to be there. So go out to the observatory at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's the 21st of December. I remember the date because my boyfriend and I were about to go back to Northern Ireland to announce our engagement. And it's kind of important that we're both there. <laughs> so 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm out at the observatory. It's bitterly cold. And the kit isn't working properly, as it sometimes doesn't in cold weather. Yeah. So you do what we traditionally did with bits of kit. You thump it. You kick it. You swear at it. You breathe on it. And you flick switches in the hope it'll come back to life. And it did. And it did for five minutes. And it was the right five minutes. And it was looking at the right bit of sky. And in came blip, 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 blip. This time one and one quarter seconds apart. The first was one and a third. And that's great. Now we've got two. It's not little green men. There aren't two lots of little green men. Opposite sides of the universe, both deciding to signal to a rather crazy planet Earth using a really daft technique. It has to be something, some new kind of star. I got the train to Ireland. We announced our engagement. I had a great holiday. Tony kept the survey running piled the charts unanalyzed on my desk. I came back after Christmas, no sign of Tony, but quite clear what I had to do. And I started doing chart analysis, looking at another piece of chart. Oh, yep, yeah. which one's that? What? It's not either? It's a third? Gosh. Right, OK, I'd better just finish this piece of chart, and then I'll come back and check on this one, make a note. So pass on. What? Two? Three foot apart? At that point, my supervisor, Tony, appears. Look, Tony! Oh, Happy New Year. Look at this, Tony. How many more have you missed? Go back through all your old records. They're about three kilometers by this stage. But we didn't find any more, and we confirmed the third and the fourth. So it turns out to be a new kind of star totally undreamt of, hugely exciting. They're called pulsars, short for pulsating radio stars. And this is the kind of picture we have of them. There's a very compact object in the middle. It's only about 10 miles across, 10 kilometers radius. That's the ball labeled pulsar. It's spinning very, very fast about a, an axis that's upright. You know that here on Earth, magnetic north is not at true north. Magnetic north somewhere in the north of Canada. Similarly on a pulsar, magnetic north is not at true north. It's offset a bit. In this diagram, it's offset a bit to the right. And so the whole magnetic field is tilted over. And by a mechanism we still don't understand properly, a beam of radio waves comes out of that kind of funnel shape there is at the magnetic poles and sweeps around the sky. And if that sweeping thing falls on the Earth, we see a pulse, pulse, pulse. It's a bit like a lighthouse sweeping a beam around the horizon. 
And just as lighthouses are used for navigation, come the time when we travel through space in spaceships, we'll use these things as navigation beacons. Because we'll have a radio telescope, one of these big dishes, strapped to the side of our spaceship. And we steer it around and we say, yep, there's that pulsar, yep. There's that one. There's that one. So we're here. The technology at the moment means you wouldn't so much strap a radio telescope on the side of your spaceship as strap your spaceship on the side of a radio telescope. But, you know, the techniques are changing very, very fast. And it'll work as navigation beacons because each pulsar, like each lighthouse, has its own characteristic flash rate and flash pattern. They seem to be individual and unique. We wrote up this first result and subsequently the other three, and there was a huge amount of press interest. The pulsars, as you can see on this slide, were actually named by the science correspondent of a rather right-wing English broadsheet, the Daily Telegraph, but they do do good science uh, coverage. But I just wanted to say a word or two about the typical press interview. There'd be Tony Hewish, my advisor, and myself, and they'd turn to Tony and ask him about the astrophysical significance of this discovery. And he got pretty good at explaining that. And then they'd turn to me for the human interest. Yeah, I think a few of you have guessed what this is. What are my vital statistics? How many boyfriends do I have at once? Am I taller than Princess Margaret or not quite so tall? And is my hair brunette or blonde? No other colours are allowed. I felt like a bit of meat. And then the photographer would say, could I open a few more buttons, please, for the photograph? They did not know how to handle a young woman scientist. You were a young woman, and never mind what came after that. And you were page three. Or at least that's where they'd like you to be. I would have loved to turn a very sharp tongue on them, but I was in a vulnerable position. I'm a postgraduate student. I haven't even written my thesis and got my doctorate. I haven't got a job. I need good references and the support of the powerful people in the laboratory and in Cambridge. And I can't afford to say what I think to a journalist. So I didn't. But as you may gather, the memory is still a bit uncomfortable. This discovery was totally unexpected, absolutely crazy, which is why we, let alone anybody else, had such trouble accepting that it was real. But we fairly quickly convinced people it was real. I contend that I made this discovery because of imposter syndrome. Now, how many people here have heard of imposter syndrome? Oh, well done, Ireland. We're doing quite well. Okay. For the benefit of those who haven't, uh, you come from the Gael Tack, you come from the wilds of Donegal, and you find yourself in Dublin, this great city where they speak English. You're going to study, and everybody's incredibly bright, and you're not up to this. It happens, I work in Oxford now, we find it happened to students who come to Oxford. It happened to me, I now recognize, when I came to Cambridge. And people would say, oh, they're all terribly bright here. <gasps> I'm not this bright. Hey, they've made a mistake admitting me. They're going to discover and they'll throw me out. And in bad cases, and this does happen sometimes with Oxford students, particularly with people short in confidence, they say, I better leave before they throw me out. And they quit. Well, I wasn't a quitter. And I said, they're terribly bright here. I now know something I didn't know then, and maybe you don't know was said of Cambridge cosmologists, frequently in error, but never in doubt. <laughs> but I didn't know that, and I was really over-impressed. 
and I thought, right, I think I'm going to get thrown out of this place. I'm not bright enough. But I am going to work my very, very hardest and most thoroughly so that when they throw me out, I won't have a guilty conscience. I will have done my best. And that's what I was doing. And I was chasing up every flipping anomaly from that radio telescope, which led to a lot of anomalies and this thing. It helped me survive through the next phase of my life. And I was slow, actually, to twig what was going to happen. Following the discovery, um, it's, I got, well, I got engaged to be married between discovery numbers two and three. And people were very, very happy to congratulate me on my engagement. But actually, nothing was said about this discovery. Because young women were meant to get engaged and married, not make major astrophysical discoveries. I did marry as I finished my PhD. My husband worked in local government. He moved his job every ooh, five or ten years, which didn't help my job situation. And we had a child, and there wasn't much in the way of childminding because it was proven in England that if mothers worked, the children were delinquent. How many of your mothers worked? And how many of you are delinquent? <laughs> two. Two. This is Ireland. <laughs> oh, he's French. Even worse. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, attitudes are changing, but changing a bit slowly. So my career um, was very curious. And the neighbors were puzzled by my wanting to work. One to, said to me, you've got a husband and a new baby and a new house, and you say you're bored? What's wrong with you? I think I got that slightly sharp repost because I was challenging a decision that maybe she had not taken very consciously to be a stay-at-home mother and wife. And I argue that my generation of people particularly women, are at the kind of turning point between those who, women who didn't work and women who now have the chance to work. And I found also it's frequently been other women who've said to me, are you sure you want to do physics? And the answer is yes, but it doesn't seem to help them somehow. So I judge that it's women who are the custodians of what it's proper for women to do, but if you do work as a scientist, uh, it's still a male-dominated field, and it's the male hierarchy that often determines whether or not women advance. So this is an electromagnetic spectrum, all the wavelengths like light, and I have worked in just about every bit of that band in my career. I've worked as a researcher, a university lecturer, a tutor, a manager, a professor, a head of department, a dean, and a PR and outreach person. And it's been good to get to try all these things, because I discovered I was good at more of them than I had imagined. But it's not the traditional male pattern, I have to say. And I also have to observe that my career is peaking very nicely at the moment when I'm 70 plus. So the honest assessment is that my career was actually a succession of jobs, which at times felt a bit like snakes and ladders, because I would climb up the ladder, and then a husband would say, it's time he moved to another area, so I'd go to Juvenile, <laughs> to another institution, and start climbing up a ladder there. But I have learned to make the best of the opportunities that are offered you, and above all, to hang in there. And that particularly would be my message to folk today, along with this slightly outrageous one from the United States. Thank you for your interest.